It's a pleasure to come and promote this thing which I believe in so strongly. Um, we actually started through the Missoula Demonstration Project. Do you remember that one? Yes. That changed into Life's End Institute, enhancing the quality of life's end. And when we got on board, we were one of the many task forces that they had. I was right on, right at the beginning, I was on the Faith Community Task Force because of the ministries that my husband and I have been doing for a long time. But then um, also joined on with story keeping. And we were doing, they were doing a study over at the Missoula Manor in, in uh, cooperation with the University of Montana to see if they could get some data to show that 
telling a, your story helps your yourself feel better, you know, that it's a positive thing. And they wanted to see if there was some data. And, and through all of that time, they actually did, they were able to do it. But I, that was when I first joined. And we would gather around a little table, and at that time we were down to four to six individuals at one table, and we were at a bunch of these going on at the same time. And we'd go once a, m a week to that, and we call those, since then, we've called them story circles. And it's been really marvelous. And I've gone to various groups of people on a regular basis, like four times in a row, once a, a week for a month. And so the people involved, um, Beehive, you know, they have like five, four or five different groups, home groups. And so I, I would contact the activities directors in these various places and say, would you like to have this? And of course they would. And what happens is if you know, well, some people don't remember, but, but you start, once you start saying your story, you start remembering more stories and more stories. And so um, it was a marvelous thing to, to do those kind of story circles. Another thing we did for a while was we went to the dialysis unit over at St. Pat's because perhaps you're familiar with this, but in case you're not, individuals go three times a week for four hour stretch and they are isolated. I mean, they're well taken care of, but they can't really talk to anyone except the people that come and visit them, the caregivers. So we would go, we would, uh, the channel was through the activities director, and we would go and say, would any, do you know of anybody who would like to tell their story? And we would go for as many times it, it was necessary to, till they felt like they had their story. So it was usually three to five times once a week, sometimes more if people have really long stories. But what would happen is, this was kind of a lot of work, but we would, I, we weren't doing audio recordings then, so I would just kind of take scratchy chicken notes and, and get back on my computer and write it out. And these stories were marvelous because what they were able to do is share their stories with these people who they only saw in the waiting room coming and going. But then they got to know who these other people were that were sitting in the same room with them, which was really valuable. We, that was all volunteer. So that kind of dissipated after a while, but it was very valuable. And if anybody wants to reinstate that, it would be great. So we were doing things like that. Now, um, I'll get a call every once in a while of a family member who, or a person, or a friend of a person, who says, so-and-so has a really great story. We shouldn't lose it. And so I've been going several times now to different people, and now I will audio record their stories. I have not gotten the right uh, voice to text, but that will be a real enhancement to to catch that on the computer because in the days that we were doing it, they didn't exist. So that'll be terrific because that's their voice. Now I've done that. One individual, I had 10 sessions with him, and each session I had a gal transcribe the stories with every pause and every um and ah, and it was his voice. And at the end of the sessions, I gave him not only the printed out material, which wasn't really, I mean, once you got into it, it was kind of fun. You got to feel his voice. But I also gave him all the audio recordings, but he never shared them with his family. When he died, they were thrilled. It was like he was in the room with them. And even the printed page, because this woman had, had done, she was a, a, a court reporter, a, what do you call it, Stig stenographer or whatever. And so she, she had every little piece of, of, of conversation, including my voice. But that's a point you want to remember, that when you're doing these audio recordings, you try to keep your voice out of it. But you have lots of expressions in your face so that, so that you can keep them talking without saying a word. So, so that was re really good to do that and to, to be right there on top of it. So, story keepers. We started, you know, Ira Bayok and Barbara Spring were the ones that got MDP started, Missoula Demonstration Project. And she was on the story keeping board right from the beginning. And um, 
she said one time, um, she related this story that Ira told her that over at the hospice house, remember there was a hospice house at the end of Mullen Road? There was a gentleman there and he was just getting more and more ornery and the nurses said, Ira, could you come out and see if we could do something for her, maybe change his medication or whatever. So he's out there at a time when, his, when the wife of this patient is out there and he just casually asks, so how did you two meet? And that started his healing. They started sharing and they had an audience. You see how important that is to have an audience? Because you can't just husband and wife talk and nobody wants, you know, they don't want to go over their life. But if there's an audience, then you, you start doing it. And that started many different storying from the two of them. And he calmed down and he was more passive and that's what he needed. It wasn't more medication, it was being known and being loved and listened to. And so that's all part of it. Um, but in story keeping, we, it started off interviewing people at the end of their lives. But we soon realized, of course, everybody has a story. One of my favorite ex examples of this is one of my colleagues, Judy Wright, who maybe some of you know, she interviewed her granddaughter, who was six. And uh, she just jotted down all the things her granddaughter wanted to say. And at the end, they bound it together with a few pictures and captions and said, my first six years. And so then the mom read it, and the mom said, that happened? I never knew about that. And so we all have our own little stories. And sometimes nobody's around to hear them. And so help each other, you know, if you know a, a little kid or an elderly person or whoever in between. So that goes on. And I wanted to say about um, one of the story workshops, an assignment was, and this is a, a very interesting assignment, write a letter to anybody you want, whether they're dead or alive, or whether they're famous or obscure, and just take some time and write that letter. Well, at the end of it, people in this particular class were invited, if they wanted to, say anything about their experience. And this one fellow had been in the army, and all the, the decades since then, he had been struggling concerning this one individual. And he wrote a letter to that individual. And as he wrote the letter, he realized a whole different point of view that that person could have been coming from. And, and, that, and that really healed him and dissipated that very disturbing part of his memories. So that was an interesting thing that we, ex we know about and can experience. And one more thing on that line was, is I, I guess you had some workshops, but there's something that they refer to as an intellectual legacy. And some people have written whole books as, well, maybe you've seen the book about the father giving his son some advice. You know, don't ever do this and please do that and whenever you get a chance, this is good. And, and the intellectual legacy is another kind of way to share who you are and let people know what are the things that are important to you. So you might think about things like that. Um, the, the newspaper, this was printed right when, when Missoula demonstra state demonstration started. And um, the Missoulian put this out, but you can grab one on your way out. This particular one was published specifically for Story Keepers of Missoula, and it's by Richard Stone. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, in a what is it? it's a happening that happens every year in Jonesboro, Tennessee, called the National Storykeeping Storytelling Festival, National Storytelling Festival, and. People from all over the world, but all over this country, come to Jonesboro, Tennessee for about five days. And they have tents, you know, circus sized tents, like six of them, all around the town. The town has kind of grown up around this whole theme, and they are ready to have this influx of thousands of people into their little tiny cute town. They've kind of re 
kept their town looking quaint and old fashioned. But the, the storytellers are magnificent. These are professional storytellers, but they're not true stories necessarily. But they're fantastic. If you ever get a chance to be in Jonesboro, Tennessee in October for their festival, it's so worthwhile. But this guy, Richard Stone, is his name down here, Richard Stone. He was one of the first people who went to these festivals and started promoting personal stories, true stories, your stories. And there are some storytellers that come to this every year, to that festival, who tell their own stories. And they are so magnificent that, you know, you are enwrapped. You just, you know, like if you're hearing it in the car, it's one of those, what do you call it? Driveway, driveway places. You don't want to get out because this is marvelous. So true life stories. This guy wrote us an edition so that we could um, have it available for people who are really interested in trying to capture their own stories. So these are available. Now we've been charging $5 a book, but I would give them away if anybody wanted it because they, it'll help you. But um, storying. So all of us have our own stories. And it seems daunting, you know, to start saying, well, what is my life story? And so there's a few things, exercises that we can do. And so we don't have paper and pencil right now. But could you? We could, if you like. No, 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 that's OK. Oh, that's a whole different story. <laughs> but um, just, just quietly think right now. How many different addresses have you lived at? How many different places? Can you remember the address or, or just that you were in this particular place? So I'm just going to be quiet for a minute. I want you to really think about that. And maybe you can count them up if you possibly could. Over one month. Two months, whatever. Did you get a hold of some? Some people have already done this. I just gave a presentation with the uh, Parkinson's um, support group. And there's one gentleman who did it. And so he already knew how many different places he'd lived in. But does anybody want to tell us how many different places they, you think you might have lived in up to this point in time? Eight. How many? Eight. Eight. Good one. Anybody else? How many? 48. 48, OK. 15? 13. 13. OK, boy, you guys are good. Seven. Seven, OK. You want to know what the average is in the United States? Yeah. 27. You guys are pretty getting there. <laughs> we got the low ones and the high ones. You know, I am bingo right on 27 right now. <laughs> but I tell you what, I've lived in the same house since 1981, so I've kind of settled. <laughs> but when people are children of um, military people, boy, they have a lot of addresses, so they're balancing out some of us. All right, so you make a list. This is your homework assignment. Instead of watching that TV show that doesn't do anything for you, <laughs> just take some time to write and make that list. And then you say, oh, what were the most important people in my life when I lived at this place? And then, and then you can do that. And then what were my pets? Remember? All those great pets have already passed. And all kinds of things. Automobiles, trips, best friends. So you start filling in this graph, and you, you've almost got your memoirs. Then, here's another thing that, that's a good assignment instead of watching that TV show. You, take, you, you do some automatic writing about a phase, like uh, you're in high school. What, what did you do? What were some of the things you remember about high school? And write down, just take a piece of paper, just, just write maybe slashes in between words, phrases, one or two words together, and think about smells and sights and, and noises and activities and people and anything you can remember about your high school years. And now you've got maybe this much writing if you do that for six minutes. Somebody said, write six minutes a day. <laughs> so and now do that again for your elementary school years, or the years after you got out of high school, 
or when you were in the service or when you first got married and all, all this little stuff. And, and the suggestion is you get a three ring binder with those little um, compartments in them, those little folder things, and then you stuff that into the right place. So, so there's, some, there's two main ways people have thought about organizing their memoirs. And the seven year plan is, is, is something that we've all heard about. And, and one of my colleagues has some great questions to ask yourself. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, so, um, when you were in the years between 21 years old and 28 years old, here's some things to think about if, in case you need to jog your memory. Dating, marriage, leaving home, first apartment, entertainment, money, job, accomplishments, disappointments. So that's just in the 21, 28 years. You can, of course, do that for any of the years. And then skip into maybe uh, 49 years to 56 years. Midlife crisis, aging parents, empty nest, church, community involvement, entertainment, hobbies, interests. So here's this little piece of paper. So she's got every group of seven years to kind of jog your memory. Or you could do the phases, which seems to make more sense to me. So you would do from birth to when you started school, and then school till middle school, or whatever. And then so forth and so on. Marriage years, growing, uh, raising your children, and whatever. So those are like categories. So now you go back to your three ring binder, and you've got your little compartment, and Whenever you think of something, stuff it in the proper place. And then when you have nothing else to do, you can start writing your memoirs or whatever. Um, and there are piles of questions. Like if you're working with somebody and you just want them to have, like, like I did with story circles, and um, you know, we're, not, we're not writing this down, we're not audio recording it or anything. It's just for our own pleasure right now. And so there's lots of questions you can ask. For instance, uh, here's him by Donald Davis, who's, a, who's another one like Richard Stone, who, who really honors our personal stories. Can you remember a pet you once had? Do you remember when you tried to cook something and it didn't turn out? <laughs> Do you remember a time you broke something that belonged to someone else? Do you recall a trip you once took, et cetera, et cetera? There's pages of things like this, which are available. So uh, back to your own story, and the same thing goes for interviewing your wonderful friend or neighbor or loved one, who, th who maybe it's time to gather their stories. And so usually you don't need any of this help, because you sit down with them and you just ask them, wh where do you want to start talking? And then if it's time to actually put it down in writing, you can um, kind of figure it out as you go, chronologically, as they were telling their own stories. And it's OK if it's not chronological. It doesn't have to be. And if you read books that are written by people about their own stories, they're, they're usually collected by an incident. So whatever that incident was, cooking something that didn't turn out, there's, your, there's a whole story. And what it does is it gives you a vision of that life. If you, can, if you can describe the kitchen and the smells and everything, you don't need any more than that one little incident, right? So, so here's another thing that you can do. You write a list of, of the best friends you had in elementary school, maybe half a dozen. And then that day, instead of watching your TV show, you write what you did with that best friend. One, one little thing, maybe it's half a page or a page or two pages of, of the kinds of things you used to do with your best friend. And, and then elaborate it as much as you can remember about the five senses, the smells and the textures. So that's another thing that, that can help you get started. So when Ray, you know, Montana is a great state to have to get one place to another because you got these long car trips. So I'll often take my little journal and, and uh, you know, I've been given some really beautiful journals, but they inhibit me. So I go to CVS and I get these little things. <laughs> I've got a stack of them because I feel more free and I can't spell and I don't have to make it perfect in these beautifully bound 
journals. I don't know what they're for, for <laughs> smarter people than me. <laughs> but anyway, so here we are on our car trip. And um, sometimes I'll just quietly be writing and I'll make a list. And I have a list of things. And I started this list. And it's Ray's stories. My husband's name is Ray. So he's got some great stories that he's told me, of course. But I mean, from the early days, like when he was a high school kid and he chased that skunk into the woods with his three buddies in the front seat of the truck. And they were going through the trees. And then when they realized they couldn't get out one way or the other because they had, well, so those are the kind of stories maybe your best friend or your whatever has. And so you make a list. Don't forget to get down this story, the skunk in the trunk truck. But uh, So I have a list of things like that, lists of things I don't want to forget. Or everything you can remember about Grandpa. What do you remember about your own grandfather? How did he dress? How did he smell? Did he smoke? Did you go to his house? What was his house like? What did they have for breakfast? Were you ever overnight? Things like that. So all the things you can remember. You can do the same thing for your dad and mom. Everything you can remember or what, what you don't want to forget about anybody. But the lists. So sometimes I'm in the car and I make a list of the things I'm going to make a list about. <laughs> so I don't forget so many good stories. Oh. Um, I, I should give you time to, to share. Uh, I probably could go on for a long time, but um, I know that some people are here actually ministering to other people, but how about if we just open up the floor and talk about how you see storying combining into your life, enhancing your life and enriching your life. Does anybody want to say anything? It doesn't have to be that. It can be anything that you're, you're thinking about or working on. I'll start, Susie. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Well, oh. <laughs> All right. I think it's funny. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time listening to my grandfather growing up telling stories. One thing I found is that when he's telling me a story about himself, I started to learn about me. And, oh, well, that's how I would have reacted in that story. Or, wow. um, it, you know, so I found that other people's stories. Uh, like uh, put a spotlight on who I am, and uh, so it's always kind of a storytelling. That beautiful. The interaction between the storyteller and the audience, I think it goes both ways. Good That's word. That's a good word, Amy. I'm starting a story. I'm going to be an author. I imagine in my mm -hmm. next chapter, if you will, in mm -hmm. my life. And if you have someone. Don't wait to get Susie or someone else on board to capture the stories. Don't wait until it's too late. Yeah. That's great. Which, just as you've been talking, Susie, I've been thinking about ways that you or other people initiate that more than just the kitchen side conversation, capturing maybe a few sessions with someone. And how do you initiate that with someone? Um, as far as capturing their stories um, and and story, I love that, that phrase. Uh -huh. you, you mean with, with, if I'm with an individual who wants to tell their story, how do yeah. you start? Oh yeah. yeah. You know, I often have these questions like, right now, all of you think, what is your earliest memory? Do you all have it somewhere in your mind? You know, the, uh, uh, what usually, you don't usually remember things before you're three years old. Is that about when you started remembering? Right. So sometimes that's a fun thing to do if you're just starting off. What, what is your earliest memory? And where were you? And then, oh, sit down with a little piece of paper. And as they're talking, scribble on to the side. If there's a channel they could go on at a diversion, because that was really interesting. You said you were living in that situation, and then you can go back to that when they come to a when they come to an end of whatever they were talking about. So it's important to, to scribble that on. You don't even have to look at your words if you can read your own. What do they call it? Chicken scratch. Mm -hmm. But but um, so. But sometimes you you don't have to do it chronologically. You can say, 
you know, what was a, an incident in your younger years that was astounding, either good, bad, or otherwise? When, it, when I do a story circle, a very common question I ask is, what was your favorite breakfast? And, and, in, and I was talking a lot to people from eastern Montana, and it turns out pancakes. Pancakes were right up there and oatmeal. But it was very rare that I got more than that. But it was interesting, because these are people, and this was a few years back, but you know, in their 80s, and, and so there wasn't much choice. And that was a great little thing. But I asked that question to one group, and, and this guy, I, he would never share. I had to really prod him. And I said, I said, what did your mom cook you for breakfast? And he said, I didn't have a mom. What did your dad cook you for breakfast? I didn't have a dad. What did you have for breakfast? Oh, fish, usually, maybe bacon. And after a month of storying once a week with this, this group, it turns out he, he was, he was uh, befriended by this man who insisted that he only be called Sir. So this fellow I was talking to only knew this guy as Sir. But it turns out he didn't have a mom or dad, and they lived on the shores of the Clark Fork River in Missoula. And at one point we were talking about horseback riding, and so I asked him specifically, and he said, yeah, sir and I, we went down to do a cattle roundup in Wyoming one time. And, and I said, so did you have sleeping bags? Oh, no. We would, they'd go to the dumpster and get a bunch of rags and sew them together, and that was their sleeping bag. And so their fish breakfast is what they caught that morning. And I don't know how we got bacon, but that was pretty special. We got bacon once in a while. Anyway, why did I say that? It's just about where to start talking about how to get the story started. Usually you hardly have to ask a question once they start talking because then you're scribbling down a follow-up. Home remedies are fascinating. <laughs> I think we had somebody who wanted to share. Go ahead. Oh, um, well, going back to a question you posed about storytelling in our, in our personal life. Um, my mom is a good keeper of family history. And I feel sometimes kind of selfish and want to be the one to do the interviewing. But then I learned that cousins are also in, interested in getting her stories and that you know I just want to say that's really important if they're you know find out who else if this is a personal interest who else is interested in this activity and and share that because they're going to get a different story yes. or a different version of mm -hmm. the same story mm -hmm. yeah. because there'll be a certain filter with me, you know? yeah you're right and and that's a point that we bring up sometimes when we do workshops is that Sometimes it's better to have a non-family member get the story, and then there's not, then they don't have to worry, you know. And another big question is, what is truth? Because if you have a sibling and you're both telling the same story, it's from a different perspective. And who's truth? Well, we just decided whoever's writing it, that's truth enough. <laughs> it's hard to say, but that's a good point. Good point. We and we're lucky, and Marika got to go to the. Um, healing trauma conference today. And one of the things I didn't know is that as you're doing therapy with someone about a traumatic loss, which is very similar to grief, um, and you take a, an assessment of how are you feeling about that issue, and then you have the person write it out or draw it out, and then you have a um, take that number again, oftentimes it stays the same or only changes a little bit. But when you can turn around and share what you've written, or what you've drawn, yes. or however you've expressed it, it's the action of actually sharing it with someone that suddenly that score drops that's and right. your anxiety level and the so problem great. you have with holding it inside, that that's where the release comes. So I think it is such a gift to be able to listen. Even if you can't write it the same way, that's even right. if you can't record it the right that's way, I think just the act of being the set of ears that's welcoming to it. Um, and the other thing, uh, Tanya, um, Chandler from Village Senior, they have sock hop days, and she um, has this little size zero waist and was able to wear 
actual clothes from the 50s when they had the really tiny little skirts on and when he had her hair professionally done the big bouffant is that what you call it and um, makeup and cat eye glasses and showed up at work and they all knew it was still Tanya but they totally associated with her as a person of that time and she said the story she heard and the way they interacted oh, with her would have never happened with her being Tanya the care coordinator and she said it was really like wearing a character just to hear their stories and yeah. then she saw just a different side of them in their earlier years even though they're older so I, sure, just, sure. I thought what a fun um, she just didn't expect it she thought she was just showing up for work that day and it really had an impact in her that changed her life and she looks at everyone as their story now not just as their resident that needs help you yeah. know very good yeah oh that's wonderful yeah Susie, would you speak a little bit about healing uh, with stories? I mean, the so healing. Well, I think that's what she was saying. Yeah. The, the, the woman I'm interviewing now, she prefaced the whole time with worrying about her children finding out about things that she's never told them. Mm -hmm. But once she started telling me the story, it was no big deal. She said it, and it's gone into the, you know, and and everybody's still okay and we're all still ourselves and it was so it, that whole confession thing yeah. I mean it's not even to me none, nothing she shared was really huge but it was huge for her and that she got it out and, and it is healing if there needs to be but there's another healing thing that we were talking about and and it's just reviewing the same stories at the end of life sometimes people who have their own stories it's comforting to just say it again. And for us, as friends and care caregivers, tell me about that story again. Tell me the one about such and such. And oh, they know that one, so thanks. Yeah, that was good. Good sharing. Anybody else have something to add? No, I, um, when you were talking about that, I do have memories, I do have stories. But I realized that our family was very practical, down to earth, and no one uh, was doting on me in particular. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of in my own. I was contemplative and around animals and horses and stuff. But uh, I'm just thinking of I've observed other children who are growing up like being totally doted on, and it's like, what are their stories going to be? They're going to have heard it over and over again when you did this and when you did that, but, well, yeah, I'm, I didn't have that, so mm -hmm. I have to come up almost totally. Some of those you hear a little bit of, but mm -hmm. you have to come up with it from yourself. Yeah, yeah. Well, we all have our own take on it. Yes. I mean, why does that little granddaughter all of a sudden get so <laughs> nasty when she's so sweet? <laughs> I don't know. She's got her own story going on inside. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think your comment about it's not mattering if you know if it's accurate or oh, each yeah, of us true. having a different perspective mm -hmm. on the same event. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like what you were saying about just looking at yourself and how you perceive things, and uh, it doesn't matter if there's there's no special way that that story has to be told, and if they tell it different next time, it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's right. It's that's the right. expression and the presence that we have. It's an amazing thing, yes, yes. Yeah. One of the assignments um, in our workshops was to go home and write your own obituary, leaving off the first and last paragraphs. Has anybody done that? I haven't done it, but I've thought a lot about it. What do I want to remember? You know, read the obituaries in the paper and don't even know some of these things about people. Maybe we need to start a new, a new yeah. system where people can write their own obituaries. It's so true, though, because I, I meet these amazing people, and then sometimes they read their obituaries, and it leaves me a little sad on the inside mm -hmm. because I know some people choose not to put that out to the world because if you think about it, oh. it's, it's kind of an obscene thing to live your life that you wouldn't necessarily let your neighbor know everything about you, but then the second you die, all of a sudden you share your oh, most intimate things. Like, that that's way, yeah. so reverse, almost, of if you have these great gifts and these passions, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. when you share them. Because um, I thought, why would someone not want to put their, their obituary up? And then 
had a patient tell me that. And I'm like, I can totally respect yeah, that. Yeah, I see that now. But on the flip side, these amazing stories that aren't served justice by, you know, the few paragraphs of a family in real trauma and grief that can't put a life into words like that. And I think that sometimes it is a gift um, to be able to pull out what someone's written about themselves. Yeah. yeah. Um, Time also did the, I think it was Time or people, someone, one of the big magazines um, had the 50 most fascinating people, but instead of having authors write their stories, they had some of their best friends write about them. And um, so the perspective came from another baseball player about what makes this baseball player such a great That's player. a great. Or like Maya Angelou, I think, wrote Nelson Mandela's. So it was from this perspective of this huh. peer, yeah, yeah. but still at a different level. So you got a different perspective. And it, and it was really powerful to read about these people from mm -hmm. a different perspective, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe doing that therapeutically, and it seems like that's a different type of storytelling, but still mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. pretty neat. Yeah, that's great. I wanted to mention photo journaling because <coughs> several times when we've done stories for people um, of course like like right now say what if somebody comes up and <clears throat> excuse me says well we want to do a movie about your life can you pick out 50 pictures about yourself so you go through all your things maybe 20 pictures of, and that would show your life a little bit and uh, then you take those pictures and you write something about each of those pictures you could write a paragraph or pages to describe what's going on and where were we and why did we do this and whose car was that and where did you get those clothes and all the things you can imagine to describe in that picture and put that into your the envelope in your three ring binder and when it's time to really gather up your stuff you've got a big start already but photo journaling has always been a a good, easy thing to know about doing. Does anybody else have a comment or question or statement? Have you been doing audio videos? I have not. Yeah, I have not. I, I work with a audio machine, a digital audio machine, and um, I have several contacts that do. Yeah. yeah, it's a good one. I'm sure there's plenty of people who can do it. It is interesting to look at photographs. Recently, I had the opportunity to visit my sister um, and our cousin, our second cousin, the first cousin, who's a year older than I, and my brother. And I was in the so that girl that my sister lives. Um, and, and we got to see, see photographs that we hadn't seen for a long time. Mm -hmm. We talked about photographs, and we all sewed with my mother and my sister and I sewed as kids. Oh, with yes. our clothes. So, but to look back on your clothes, oh, I mean, yes. obviously not a clothes hand, or I wasn't even then, but um, to look back at this, you remember, yes, maybe so not what you bought the material, but why oh. you sewed that particular thing, it opens up a whole other, so it's it's an, I hadn't thought of that, it's another way of, you know, opening up memories of yes. those times. Yes, so yeah, it's so regular. Mm -hmm. Making a quilt out of old uh, wool skirts, and that's, that's it right. before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Susie, do you use music? <coughs> yeah, again. Do you use music to kind of help trigger memories? Yeah, yeah. 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 it's a good idea. Now, I do have something I was going to show you. Let me see if I can put my hands on it. Oh, there it is. Um, somebody put this out, and we found it on the internet. I think it was. It's called the Astonishing Century, and. So it's all the 1900s. But you take it one page, like here I opened it up, and it's 1973 on both sides. And it'll tell you about world events, uh, like in 1973, Vietnam peace pacts are signed in January. Nation, environment, 80 nations agree to stop trade in 375 endangered animal species. Uh, it goes on science and technology, consumer products, arts and media. So there you have. You want to know what the music was back in 1973? Can you yeah. remember what you were doing back then? Uh, Rocky Mountain High, Bad Bad, Leroy Brown, You're So Vain. I don't even know. You Are the Sunshine of My Life. I know that one. Uh, so anyway, in movies, 
and books. So the, the, the famous things that were going on in 1973. So if you, you're with somebody, you can, you can ask them, what, what do you want to be reminded? You, you can think, you know, like go back to their high school years and then pick a year in their high school years and, and then you'll kind of spur their memories to go. So this is a fun book. That was a good book. I, I do have, um, oh, I didn't bring the other books. I'll show you this book, though. This is my book that Anne saw. It's called An Enthusiasm of Wax Wings. And what it is, when I started working with story keepers, I would jot down in my little journal, you know, insights, impressions, and memories. And, and so, and then I'd go to the computer and I'd work them out. And, and they're like poems. And so these are my memories. But it's not chronological by any means. And the very last part are these little um, stories, true stories of animal encounters. But this is a self-published book. Anybody can do it. The thing is, we were at the festival, festival of the book here in town many years back. Well, I could tell you when it was, <laughs> whenever this was published. I think it was 05. So probably in 04, Ray was at the festival of the book, and he bid on an auction item. And it was a self-publishing. So for 30 bucks, he could publish his own book. And we were all after him because his cooking at Perugia restaurant, people wanted his recipes. And, and um, he never did it. And then he found out his year was going to be up at the end of September. And he had 10 days. <laughs> and he said, Susie, just do your poems and stories. So <laughs> So in 10 days, I put this together. It's, it has a few typos, but I threw in some pictures I had already drawn, and anybody can do that. Mm. Oh, sure. Yeah. And yeah, pass this around. This is so fun. It's such a great little book. What are other ways that people can, I mean, besides the self publishing, this is with iUniverse? Um, yeah. I know. There are all sorts of software programs to make oh, books. Yes. And Yes, before I did that, I made my own little book. And it includes a lot of those stories. And here's a little book that I put together. And uh, so um, being an artist, I just kind of did it by feel. I didn't really know what I was doing. But I, I printed out from the computer the poems. I call them poems. They're kind of like stories, too. Uh, and then I. <laughs> I cut them out, put them together the way I wanted them, and then I took them to the coffee shop, and so I double-sided them, and then I uh, put them together. So this is a three, one of those green folders, file folders, so it's kind of bins, right? And this is just muslin that I dyed, and the end pages are from the University of Montana bookstore. <laughs> and the way you make a little book is you make a signature. So this is such a short little book that I took my sewing machine and I sewed down the middle, tied them on the back side, and then you put an extra page in and you glue it into your, see this? This is the extra page. So you glue it into the folder and then you cover it with your end page. So anybody could do this. You could make your own little book. I did these and I gave them away as Christmas presents. <laughs> so you could pass that around if you wanted to. Easy does it. Well, so we all have our own stories, and they're all fascinating and unique, and it's great to share them. Does anybody else have any comments or questions? Well, I want to just say something. Yes, yes. Talking about music. Um, oh, yes. Triggering. My mom has Alzheimer's. Yeah. I noticed when I visit her, if I don't have music playing, she gets really upset. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just a course bring she'd know all the words. Oh, yeah. And then she would remember, like, what people were wearing or who she was. I mean, it just brought back so many things that she would remember just from a song. Uh -huh. Have you ever written them down? No. Oh, well. No. <laughs> There's the something you could do. <laughs> yeah, they just made a documentary, Alive Inside. Have you seen yes. that or heard about it? It's all about listening to music that is in your real interest and in someone coming alive and they video of that. And uh, it's pretty impressive. They just won some awards. Yeah. Uh,
was a lot of research about auditory yes. being our earliest sense because we're of the heartbeat and we hear our mama's heartbeat when we're in utero. And so drumming is, you know, maybe no coincidence that drumming is an early form of, of human replication of music and early music form. And um, so there is a lot of research about music being able to really go back and trigger memories we didn't realize we were holding. And helping people with expressive difficulties kind of connecting all those. So that's nice. So thanks for sharing. And you know, we have Terry Jimerson who had, would go around to uh, assisted living homes and, and nursing homes and sing all these old songs with his guitar. It was just wonderful. I accompanied him a few times. He's just he's got a great rapport with everyone. I don't know if he's still doing it, but he probably is. The other thing they're doing with music, uh, and I don't know uh, how recently this is, but for stroke, stroke people with aphasia, they, if they can sing what they want to say, they can say it. Mm -hmm. And really, the first time I saw that was with, what's her name, who was shot? Uh, uh, Giffords. Giffords. Yes, yes, they talked about that. And I told my sister, remember that if I have a stroke. Because I, I do have a fear of not being able to say what I want. Oh. And in case people aren't remembering that this is a wonderful technique yeah. to use. Yeah. It's, a, it's heartening that you could have that. that yeah. is. When Ray and I go to some of the assisted living homes and nursing homes, we'll find that these people are sitting there with a book in front of them. Of course, they're not, most of them aren't reading the book, but we turn the pages anyway. And, but they sing all from memory. And they don't talk to you, but they remember those songs. That's a good, that's a good word. That's a good to remember. Yeah. Susie, I have a friend who um, had an elderly mother and she was in her late 90s and um, in the Midwest. And um, last fall, she called me and said, I'm going to have to go home, I think, you know, close to the time for mom. And she said, I've got to remember to pack my letters. I said, what letters are those? <coughs> and she said she had come from a large family and that about 20 years ago, her mother had written, her father had died when she was a young girl. Her mother had written a letter to each one of her children and had sent a letter to each child about their childhood, special memories the mom had about their wow. child, um, things they did together, why that child was special among the, the group. And she said, um, Mother had given those letters to her. She was the oldest. And she said they were too old after she died. And so she said we did have a night day after she died where we all got together and opened, each of us opened our own letter. Yeah. I thought, well, what is it? That is lovely. Oh, how thoughtful makes you really think about that child. Yeah. That unique child. That unique child. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. oh. Story starters. Oh my. You know, you know that StoryCorps came into our little town and uh, they give you lots of things to think about. Uh, great questions for friends, for instance. Uh, great questions for grandparents, and then growing up questions, school questions. But this is just one of so many ideas of how to keep your stories going. But um, did anybody else get involved in that story core and hear or tell their own stories? Yeah. You missed it. Well, Alfredo Chipolato, I interviewed him on, on, in their funny little airstream. And that was fun. And then I interviewed another gal. And years later, she turned out to be my daughter-in-law. Oh. No clue that that was going to happen. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. I know every Friday when I listen to NPR and her story core, I'm ready to just 
cry. I it's know. always so good. They <laughs> pick out some beauties. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and you can get on their site and hear them all. Oh, They're just yeah. amazing. You're right. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I feel like we, if you want anything else, I don't know. Yeah. Are there any? I guess I had one question oh, us great. before we started. Uh, <laughs> And that is, I know someone mentioned sewing, um, that your family sews, and that evoked memories. Um, um, you know, just different ways to share our stories. So music, and ways that you found to be effective or surprising that you just stumbled upon when you're talking to someone that might not necessarily be verbal. Oh, wow. Well, um, that certainly happens. Yeah. Uh, for instance, um, well, there's something called a, 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 a Irish Cayley, where people just gather together and share. Mm -hmm. And they can sing, they can tell legends and myths or their own personal mm -hmm. stories. And I've hosted some of those just like here. You know, the, we could do that. We could do right here. This is a beautiful spot to do it. And uh, you just come, you don't have to share anything, but some interesting little something, a story about your own self or your family, or a legend, or a fairy tale, anything, and sing. So at one of these events, this is my favorite story, the mother of one of my friends said, she and her husband, who was a scientist, were in Africa, and um, they were staying in this little hut on stilts, and they had put themselves to bed one night, and she had been chewing bubble gum that day, and she didn't take it out of her mouth before she went to bed. But anyway, in the middle of the night, a baboon was trying to pull the bubble gum out of her mouth. <laughs> so anyway, I, that was one of my Kayleys gathered that story from a Kaylee. But ga gathering stories is just making the time. Uh, at my house tomorrow, I don't know who might ever want to do this, but we're making sankey eggs. Do you know about Ukrainian Easter eggs? Mm -hmm. It's very tedious. <laughs> you can spend hours on one egg. Usually you do two eggs at a time because you take these eggs and, and you have a little kiska, which is a teeny tiny funnel, and you put beeswax in it, and you put it up against a flame, and then you, you do these lines on this egg. And then you put the egg in a dye bath for 10 minutes. And so you have to do two eggs at a time because you're waiting for that one to get done and you do another one. So you usually do two eggs at a time. So I've done it twice this week and I'm doing it tomorrow. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if anybody wants to come and wow. come to my home and try to do a Sankey egg. Yeah. But they're hilarious and, and then, you know, they're eggs, so they're fragile. Yeah. But the, the people who do these eggs, they can have an egg that's decades old and I have several eggs like that where you just don't, you don't uh, blow them out, you keep them whole because they're stronger if you don't crack them. And the egg just uh, evaporates inside. So some of the eggs rattle, most of them don't. But um, anyway, that is a time, doing a project like that is a time to share stories. Yeah. And everybody is intense doing their little egg, you know, with the flame and all. So it's a great time to share. Anything like that is a great time to share. But just have a Kaylee, where you that's why you're together, is to share. You know, I'm talking a lot tonight, but um, in the, you make a good point, though. Distracting from the conversation, from the focus yes. of talking. Yeah, and yeah, you're all so Some of the best work is done in a car, you know, driving, storytelling, because you don't have to face each other, yeah. and there's not that pressure. So I think you make a really good point of having an activity that can mm -hmm. distract maybe shy people who are wanting to yeah. feel like they're being the focus in the interview. But if you're sharing an activity or food right. or something, yeah, I think you And you know that shy idea. person can get in on that conversation and not have to say anything and learn that it's okay to have a conversation. I can do this too one day. One thing. Um, that I found really helpful when I interviewed my grandmother uh, a few years ago. We did about 10 sessions. Mm -hmm. And I had not planned on, on doing 10 sessions. Um, but we had a, um, 
just like any scheduled meeting. So we would meet like every Sunday night at 7, and I had a digital voice recorder. And I would just choose a topic. So they were really broad. One was health. The next one was like spirituality and religion. The next one was um, her experience raising children. And it's so true when you speak about, or when you said, um, when you're interviewing, um, listening is such a huge part of that. And I found myself listening for about two hours solid, and she just ran with it. After the first session, the first session, she said, oh, no one wants to hear my stories. Yeah, they always say that. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> oh, I don't have any stories. Yeah, I don't, oh, these are, yeah, these aren't interesting. And so it's, it's um, that was a really helpful um, technique for me, was to schedule each week and then have these really general topics. Um, but I really like, like, the story core prompts yes. to help focus. Yeah. yeah. Um, just and then just listen. Yeah. Susie, yeah. when you're working in groups at the facility, mm -hmm. um, I'm just picturing someone wanting to tell their story and getting going. Like, how do you engage an entire group of people to do that and respect everybody have a, tire, a turn to share and listen? You know, usually we're dealing with a topic and we let them talk as much as they want and usually they don't want to talk too much but then you always have to have a good mon moderator because somebody will want to take over so you have to be able to guide them out of that if because it's a group experience but you know the topics are such that you know they're they're little little stories little experiences some of them some of the topics might be, do you remember the first radio? And that was so funny. One lady said, oh, I thought there were spooks in there, and I kicked it. <laughs> spooks. But, you know, you can just start getting off on things, and I don't know. I keep having this feeling and this question about where, where do we get to use this language about telling stories in the sense of not telling truths? And... Oh. Um, and how does that play in with people who haven't come to terms with their lives or their, what their true stories are and this, the, the things that they've led themselves to believe are true in an effort to make meaning out of their lives or to not hurt other people. Mm -hmm. um, and just thinking that in the terms of end of life, how you know, for any of us it would be better to, to be able to tell stories sooner than later because if things like that come to a head at the end of life it can make it really difficult to do the work of letting go and to forgive and yeah. to yeah. not be in turmoil and um, you know to not have that work to do at the end of life where you're trying to really come reconcile your own story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's a good point it seems like a lot of good work with that, though, <coughs> if people have social outlets to go to. You know, I think of veterans especially, some of um, people who struggle a lot with their stories are veterans, but they're not also comfortable telling other people that when they can go right. to a veterans group That's right. or an informal coffee group that happens to be all veterans and they can share with each other. You know, so it's almost like connecting them um, before they're so isolated that it becomes a, let's tell your story before you're ready to go. You know, whether it be a church group or mm -hmm. somewhere that you're actually comfortable mm -hmm. telling a story. So how do we keep people connected to them mm -hmm. in some way or form? Honoring one another's stories. I think part of your point, though, was that the word story has that connotation that maybe it's not a true story. It's just a story, mm -hmm. you know, like the TV stories. But um, I don't know. I, I think when you're when you're with a person and you're asking them for their story, I think they would know what you mean, you know. And if they want to make up a story about their life, okay. <laughs> My grandson does all the time. <laughs> He's got all kinds of characters. I got three new characters in my house. There's Zane, Jane, and Gain. And he tells me stories about him. Oh, he can do that. My friend can do that. <laughs> anyway. Well, I hope this has been good. I, I don't know um, how, you know, I think we have to honor one another's story so that every opportunity you have, it seems like when we 
we're kind of drifting through this little life that God has given us, if you don't mind me saying that. And, and every encounter is important. Every time you sit down with another person or stand around with another person, that's an encounter that, you know, it's, it's almost not even accidental. It's like our opportunity to share and to be alive together. So, I don't know. <laughs> That's right. What kind of ripples are you going to make by that? Oh, my husband is just a genius at that. He'll take three, to three or four times as long to go grocery shopping than I do because he talks to everybody he sees. And I say, oh, hi. <laughs> I go on my way. <laughs> anyway, maybe we can leave it at that. Keep yourselves alert. And I'm sure you'll be inspired. Thank you. Oh, thank you for inviting me.